And why is it so personal to you to shed light on the on the areas of mental health, especially with suicide prevention? You know, when I was a teenager, I attempted to end my life. I went through a stage of, of some serious bullying, divorce with my my parents. I just I felt so dark for almost a year and I decided I wanted to end my life. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast. If you're looking to hear stories of hope, inspiration, and turning your greatest adversities into your advantage, well, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Jason Lachance, and through my addiction recovery and struggles with anxiety and depression, I dug into my passion of speaking with people who have transformed their lives. And while you're checking Knocking Doors Down out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. I'm joined today by Brandy Vega. Thanks for joining me, my friend. I appreciate the opportunity to connect. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get into the amazing work you're doing with uh, Good Deed Revolution and uh, Promise to Live, the upcoming event that we're going to talk about as well. But uh, I always like to start with gratitude. Three things you're grateful for today. I, what am I grateful for today? I am thankful for this opportunity to talk to you and for media. Media allows us to ca- connect in a big level. I'm thankful for my health. I've recently lost about nine pounds and I'm thankful that I'm healthy and that I, I can get up and walk and breathe and function. And I am thankful for, um, I'm thankful for God. I appreciate that love and that influence and, and everything that I get from, from that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You, you brought up, I want to be transparent with the listener here on this one. We had to reschedule this interview and you brought up thankful to be able to get up and move. And um, we rescheduled cause I was going through a bout of depression that day. Uh, my father is a quadriplegic. His health is getting worse and worse. And, and this is one of the main reasons that I really just resonated with you when we met through a mutual friend is, Hey, these things are real guys. There's still a lot of people that that like anxiety and depression aren't real. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm here to tell you they freaking are. Yeah, they are. They are. And and it's okay to acknowledge them. Just because you acknowledge them doesn't, doesn't change anything. It actually brings it to the light. When we keep things in the dark, it becomes more of a heavy, dirty secret. When we bring it to the light, it feels easier to see our way through. And why is it so personal to you to shed light on the on the areas of mental health, especially with suicide prevention? You know, when I was a teenager, I attempted to end my life. I went through a stage of of some serious bullying, divorce with my my parents. I just I felt so dark for almost a year and I decided I wanted to end my life. And I was in the middle of an attempt and and envisioned my mom finding me and and I stopped. And, and I never had that desire again. So because of Mm -hmm. my attempt, and I mean, I had attempted, um, I actually learned a lot about suicide, mental health prevention. I got training and education. I taught with the attorney general and I went to schools and talked about it. And then it hit me in the face, like a a two by four, when my 12 year old tried to end her life. Mm -hmm. And it was devastating because I knew everything what to look for. And I didn't see the signs. It's interesting because people now ask me, what should I be looking for? What are the signs of suicide and depression? I was like, don't look for signs because last I checked, we're really horrible at reading body language and people <laughs> and trying to guess. I'm not a, 
a mind reader. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. So what I tell people is just go ask the question, Hey, are you feeling suicidal? Are you depressed? Are you struggling? That doesn't plant a thought. It actually honest questions, get honest answers. So when my daughter attempted at 12, um, it was terrifying. Didn't see it coming blindsided, almost lost her, didn't talk about it because of the stigma and the shame. And so it was this dark, dirty secret basically that we carried for about two years. She told me it never happened again. Well, it did. And thankfully her friend had the courage to call 911. Police woke us up. We were able to get her to the hospital. When we got her to the hospital, they didn't even have a bed for her. They had had so many kids attempt suicide that day, eight to 18 years old, blew my mind. And I'm in the room crying with the doctors and nurses. And they said, we cannot keep up. We don't know what's going on. We've never seen anything like this. And we didn't know for a while what was going to be the outcome with my kid. I volunteered at the hospital for seven years, not that one, but another one doing nobody dies alone mm-hmm. in spiritual care. I would sit there with patients. I would sit there with their families. I would hold their hand. Many of them were suicides. I had been there as an advocate for them, but when it's you, <laughs> it it was the worst experience of my life. And, and I finally, the second day I was in my car and uh, there was another, I don't know, they said 10, 12 suicide attempts that day again, like ridiculous numbers. And I thought, I can't do the same thing again. I can't run this risk of losing my kid. And so I did the most vulnerable video I've done in my entire life. And by the way, I was in the army as a broadcast journalist. I was a public right. affairs specialist, interviewed the president, reported for Fox News. I've been on TV most of my career. I do media and broadcast. That was the hardest video I've ever done because it was so vulnerable. But I sat in my car and I just said, my daughter tried to end her life. I don't know if she's going to make it. If she does, I don't know what to do. I need help. Please help me. I know some of you have been through it. And when you're in crisis, you can't think straight. Yeah. And uh, that video overnight went viral. It had over 12,000 views. I woke up to hundreds of messages in my inbox from people I would have never thought were going through this kind of stuff. I lost my son. I lost my mom. I lost my husband. I I attempted all these things and I was just blown away. And um, my friends at NBC saw that video and they came out and said, Hey, will you share your story with us? This is a huge problem. I said, no, absolutely not. Too painful, too personal, too sure. private. I am not sharing this story. Thanks. Good luck. Move on. And, um, but then I was also praying to God, please save my kid. (laughs) I'll do anything. I'll do anything you want. And I got the overwhelming impression that I can't deny that was, I'll give you a second chance. There's not a third. What are you going to do with it? Mm. And at that point, I'm like, whatever needs to be done, I'll do it. And so I thought about what, and, and shortly after that, my daughter, uh, she woke up. And she had her faculties and I I asked her, are you glad you're alive or do you wish you would have died? And she said, I didn't really want to die, but it was too late. Mm. And this is who I'm doing it for. I'm doing it for all the people because it's not too late for you. And I got a second chance and that just doesn't happen. And so I came back and I thought, okay, well, I own a video production studio called Vega Media in Salt Lake. Right. I've been doing production for 28 years. I, I know how to tell stories and do media and broadcast. And then I reached out to the nonprofits. I said, how can I help you? And then, um, you know, I was working that way. And, and my kid's progress was rough. She was in the hospital for a week or two, day tr- inpatient day, like we were right. going through it all. But two weeks later, <laughs> the media called me again and said, Brandy, this is such a huge problem and we can't get anybody to talk about it. Will you please reconsider? And I just thought, I said, I'd do anything if my daughter was saved, she's saved. Is this a test? And if not me, who, if I'm terrified to go on camera and share this story and I'm used to being in front of the cameras, it's <laughs> my yeah. like, what, what does a normal person feel like? Right. What so, president did you have to deal with, by the way? I interviewed George W. That tells oh. you how old I am. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, that's right. We're about the same age, but yeah. Oh, gosh. George yeah, W. I was in up the, there. All I right. was in the Army from 1995 to 2003. Up there. All right. It's nice to meet you, Brandy. This is great. Yes. Thank you so much, George W. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he but, was great. Yeah, I just had I had to ask. I was just curious. But yeah, so at this point, you, the, you've, you've recognized, though, that, hey, 
the media is still calling and no one's talking about this. Nobody's talking. And so I reluctantly did the interview. I mean, reluctantly. Mm -hmm. And here's what I said when they interviewed me. I said, if you're watching right now, please stop what you're doing. And in fact, I'll invite your listeners. If you're listening or watching right now, stop what you're doing and go check on your loved one, your child, your spouse, your friend, and just ask them point blank. Are you suicidal? Don't beat around the bush because honest questions give honest answers. And studies show you're not going to plant an idea. You're not. Either they are or they aren't. And so I said this. And after the news aired, I got this message from a father. And he said, Brandy, you just saved my daughter's life. I said, I said, what do you mean? I was watching you on the news when you said, go check on your child. I felt it. And I did. And the second I went into her room, she had already written her note. She was in the process of trying to end her life. I caught her. We're in the hospital. Oh. And then I got another message from a family a little while later. And they said, thank you for being vulnerable on the news. We went and talked to our son. He confessed he had a plan to kill himself this weekend. We're getting him help. That triggered everything that we're doing right now. Because if my little personal painful private story i didn't want to share on on news on local news that reached who knows how many 20,000 25 30 i don't know yep. if i could save two that i know of what could we do if we could reach 100,000 200 2 million sky's the limit so we put together our show last year and we reached 160,000 people and what we did is we we bootstrapped it and we got singers, celebrities, entertainers, influencers, everybody donated their time. And we put on a three hour fun, family friendly show and we talked openly and authentically. We started the conversations because starting these conversations, stop stigma, saves lives. Mm -hmm. That's why we're having this right now, because it allows us to be a safe space. Somebody goes, oh, gosh, you know, if if Jason can admit that he struggles. If Brandy, like that story, I shared just yesterday on this thing and I had about 10 executives reach out and say, my kid's going through this. I'm going through this. We're all in this together. Doesn't discriminate. Young, old, rich, poor, black, white. You're not alone. We're mm -hmm. all in it. It's the biggest problem plaguing the planet. Mental health, suicide, addiction, trauma. We're all in it. Yep. Yeah. And it's the, you know, the numbers are, are staggering. I was, you know, as always, try to do research i enjoy numbers especially if they're accurate but i mean goodness look at uh you know they're expecting 2022 in the u.s alone near 50,000 u.s males committed suicide it's a ever-growing problem not just with our our youth but we're seeing it with adults and although women's numbers is only about a quarter of that of men it's still a quarter that's still yeah that's still ten thousand too many one is too many because it's preventable. It's, it's the one thing that is really preventable. It's not terminal. And I think people are afraid because when you when you struggle with it, it might feel like it's a terminal disability or, or, or consistent struggle. But there is help and there's hope. And that's what we want people to know. We want them to know about amazing resources like 988, the 911 for mental yeah. health. We, you can call or text it 24-7 anywhere in the United States. We want them to know about NAMI, N-A-M-I.org, or AFSP.org, or the JED Foundation. There's so many incredible groups out there, but unfortunately, just not enough people know about them. And that's part of our campaign is to spread the message. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's it's a real challenge. I was having a conversation. Tell, tell me if this resonates with you, with a, a mentor. And I brought up the point that, you know, I have to accept that people are passionate about what they're passionate about, and they're not going to necessarily be passionate about what I'm passionate about, but I can try to make them aware of my passion. I know that's a little wordy, but, but I have yeah. to, I mean, I, I've, you know, I was doing a Narcan training the other day, um, and, uh, somebody had seen me and shot me a text. What are you doing? I was doing a Narcan training. What's Narcan? I'm like, well, have you heard of this fentanyl thing and opioid crisis? Well, it prevents an overdose. And all of a sudden, you know, they are at least inquisitive about it. That doesn't mean they're going to go out and want to give out Narcan like, like I am or like you do talk in classes or so open or put on these amazing events. But, you know, we can switch them on and at least plant that yeah. seed of knowledge up in there so they can start to 
you know, take those steps. Not every parent that had a child that unfortunately attempted suicide will become what you're doing, but they can do their part. That is for sure. And that's what's great about the Promise to Live campaign. And that's why we created it this year, because what we're asking everyone to do, and you can do it, and I beg you to do it right now, is going to the promise, the number two, live.org. And we're asking everybody to promise right now, whether or not you personally struggle, that if you do ever find yourself in this really dark place, just promise you'll reach out to someone, a friend, a family member, a trusted resource, or you can call or text 988. Once you make that promise, the number two in that is for everyone else you love. Share it on social media because when you share, again, you become the safe space. It starts the conversations. It stops stigma. It saves lives. And that's how we have to reach it. We have to become the safe space. And so, you know, every 40 seconds, somebody dies by suicide. Yeah. In less than that amount of time, you can go to promise to live, make the promise, share the promise. It's so simple, but significant. And that's what we need to do. I, I with your last comment, I was thinking about that. I, I've been passionate about this because it hit me so personally. And I've, I've been trying to engage and engage and, you know, knocking on everybody's door and emailing everybody and reaching out to all these CEOs and influencers and kind of getting, you know, no response because, because they didn't take it personal. Well, then we all lost a friend in our community just within the last week or two. Everybody lost somebody that we knew in our circle and it hit everyone in the heart and they streamed his service this Saturday or this Sunday. And, and so this week, all those people I've been trying to get on board for the last two years were like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And there's a part of me that's like, gosh, I wish you would have been in a year ago or two years ago, but you know what? You're in today. Yeah, And we can't look back in bitterness. We move forward in faith. So join the party. Let's move forward and let's stop this problem. It's, it's a huge, huge problem and we can do something. Knocking Doors Down by Carlos Vieira. Now available wherever you get audiobooks. I wasn't done partying and I didn't want the binge to end. I think I knew that when I finally got home, I'd have to face what I had done. And I wasn't ready to do that. Being responsible for my actions wasn't something I was looking forward to. I had abandoned my wife and baby, my family, and my business. I wanted to avoid the shame of returning to what I had left behind. Even though I was not yet going home, I wasn't sure I had enough resources to continue the binge. Click the link in the podcast description to find out more. Yes, we can. And I, what I really love about what what you're doing with a promise to live, you know, I'm a 12 step guy in my recovery is that big accountability piece. And so, so much of like life. And I think, tell me what you think is self-esteem and, you know, our value sets accountability, is such a huge part. And when we start to take account of, you know, become accountable for, for all things, our thoughts, our feelings, because, you know, I know for me, when I go through a depression or have a stroke of anxiety, it is my thoughts, my feelings. It is not, no one else is doing it to me. This is the way I'm processing things at that time. And I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not saying this, you know, I'm not saying that in reference to people that are going through trauma. I understand that is a, a, a position in which you are being victimized. I'm saying for me now, currently where I'm at. Yeah. And it's so important to just have accountability in life and reach out to someone. And, you know, that's why in 12 step programs, we have sponsors and sponsees. And, you know, I think this campaign gives that kind of opportunity. If it's, if it's not a, if it's not a peer, if you're a teenager and you're not comfortable with it, but you know, find a mentor, find who that mentor is and, and have them help keep you accountable. It's, That's what we want them to do is find those resources. And the big thing is when you talk about accountability, what's the power of a promise? For Mm. me, I promised God I'd do anything if my child was saved. I would have quit doing this last year because it was just too hard. It's too painful when you have a wound and you keep peeling the scab every time, every day. I'm talking about it. I keep opening it up. Sometimes it hurts and I'm sobbing. And then other times it doesn't hurt as much because it's it's not as tender and I can get through it. But it was hard and I would have quit. But I promised that I would do whatever it took 
And this is my mission. And so when people make a promise, studies show a basic promise, people are 60 to 80% more likely to keep a promise made ahead of time. Now that's not directly related to mental health or anything like that. There's not a study that I know of. If somebody knows, let me know. So we're trying it with this, but I mean, if the power of that gets you through a moment, if you're thinking, you know, I promised Jason, if I found myself in this dark place, I'd, I'd reach out to someone. Mm-hmm. I don't want to break my promise to you. Oftentimes we don't love ourselves enough. We don't. We love everyone else around us. We care about everyone else around us, but we could give two, you know, about ourselves. Oh, it's okay. You can say shit. <laughs> I'm unedited. <laughs> I just feel like, um, and, and that's what I've told people. Even if you don't want to live for you right now, can you find something or someone to live for? We just got to get them through that moment. And mm-hmm. if it's for your spouse or your child or, you know, your mom, find that someone, find that something and make a commitment and make a promise right now. Even if it's to me, when I did nobody dies alone, I sat there with strangers and with, as they took their last breath, mm-hmm. I held their hand. I loved them. You're, you weren't born alone. You don't die alone. You don't struggle alone. Even if you feel alone, you're not. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I care. Jason cares. And there's plenty of people out there who don't know you yet that love you and care and want you to be here. And they will be here for you if you allow us. So don't struggle inside alone. No. And, and understand that a lot of these thoughts, these feelings, I mean, tell me from your personal experience, I know for me, cause I can, I have the tools to manage it now. Some days I I do. I mean, I message you, I am just not feeling well today. And some days the anxiety is so bad or uh, depression doesn't come as frequent as it used to. Um, But I also know it will pass. And I think it's so hard, especially with younger people, to to make it clear this this will pass. I promise you this path will pass. The hopelessness will pass. You will start to feel hopeful about life, especially if you start to take action, like making the promise. And I tell people, like, especially my kids, I've got a a 21, 16 and six year old. I'm like, you have survived all of your hardest days. Every moment in your life you thought you could never get through the days you just thought you couldn't survive one more, more moment. You made it through. You're here. You're here right now. And that gives you an opportunity. And what I've also been um, studying the last four years, really, but especially the last two years, is what are resources? And I'm learning incredible things because I meet up with doctors and educators and people from all around the world who are working in this. And I'm learning that a lot of women with postpartum have uh, copper toxicity. Mm. Sometimes we think it's all here, but really it's some kind of imbalance in our blood. And so a doctor was doing studies. He had a hundred women with severe postpartum suicidal. Every single one of them had a high level of copper toxicity. They regulated that and they were all back to themselves. So, Hmm. you know, sometimes we feel like there's no hope for me. I don't think that's true. People are finding resources in ketamine. They're finding it in psychedelics. They're finding it in other treatments. They're finding it in holistic and breathing and nutrition and exercise. And so I'm trying to gather all of those resources because what works for me might not work for you and vice versa. But if we can find this collective, collaborative resource base where people can say, I've never even heard of that. Maybe I need to get my blood tested. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've never tried this. And so that's something else I want to bring is we're putting together resources. We're looking for collaborators. We want to be a solution and a partner and just help people get through whatever it is they're going through. Yeah. I, I personally, you know, for me, when I, you know, I, if I work with a sponsee, I say, Hey, I'm not a doctor. I can only speak when it comes to your depression and anxiety from personal experience, but I challenge you to get the four daily. And they're like, what's that? I'm like, it's your dose, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, and understand you know, us as an addict, uh, we used to get them on the front end and pay for it on the back end. Well, now you got to pay for it on the front end and get the reward on the back end. It, you know, I love it. everything from getting outside, taking a walk, running, lifting weights, uh, connecting with someone that you care about. Heck, a hug. People yeah. don't realize how good a hug is for your brain. I challenge you. No shit. <laughs> Instead of that quick side hug, if it's somebody, you know, you can be vulnerable. Go in for 15 seconds. Watch how much your mood is going to change. 
Oh yeah. I, I love that. I think that that one is critical, giving them a hug, holding the door, just checking in on them. There's so much that we can do. There's also part of the reason I do this. I'm not going to lie. is I get a helper's high. Oh yeah. You live 20% longer. You're 20% happier when you're in the service of others, when you're paying it forward, when you're volunteering, you get out of yourself. Oh, poor me. And you start saying, wow, my life could be a lot worse. And when you're helping other people, it, it increases your gratitude. It increases your purpose, your meaning, and it makes you feel better about things. So a lot of what I do is a little bit selfish. I'm doing it because my body needs the reward of being worth, you know, worth something and, and paying it forward and being able to know that what I do matters and I'm helping people. That's called a helper's high. You can get that for free. And when you go to the drive through Look the worker in the eye and say, hey, how's your day doing? How's your day going? Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I hope you know you're appreciated. Yeah. It's so simple. Hold the yeah. door for somebody and say, hey, you know what? Have a great day. I love that blouse. You have a nice smile. Enjoy your day. That's easy. I got the uh, I was given the 10 tennis shoe challenge uh, by a by a neuropsychologist that I know. And I'm like, man, that works like, you, you know, somebody I you know, just males, but walk by, I'm like, Hey man, I like those kicks, you know, and they look down at them and then they look back at you and that look back turns to a smile yeah. or, a, or a thanks. You know, it's, it's all these little things. Uh, I got a funny story. I was in the line at the uh, big coffee shop. I'm not going to say their name cause they don't sponsor send any money for us <laughs> to help people. So, um, there was a police officer behind me. I paid at the window. I asked, Hey, what, you know, what did this officer order? Well, it's a, the the exit's like getting on the freeway. Well, he lit up the lights and I'm like, oh, my God, really? And he comes up and he goes, hey, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Here I am. I'm like, well, you gave me a heart attack and he just <laughs> wanted to say thank you. And I was like, no, thank you. It's tough what you do, especially in today's climate. I just wanted you to know I appreciate you, but but don't do that again. You gave me an effing heart <laughs> Next attack. Next time you can just flip your light and wave. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. That's cool. I love that you do that. I, I find so much joy in just the simple things, you know, and, I, and that's something we can all do. It like it really does help. Well, and I think it goes to show the the word agenda oftentimes holds such a negative connotation and it shouldn't because your agenda is clear my agenda is clear what do we get out of it well i don't know i mean i'm like you i believe in a higher power and it feels like mm, i'm i'm doing work he's doing work through me and that's called purpose so that's yeah. my agenda right. i mean you know uh I love what, that. Would it be great if uh, eventually I make millions of dollars a year? Sure. You know why? Because then I can help even more people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, while you were saying that, I thought of somebody You know, when you're giving appreciation. And I want to give appreciation to Kevin Guest. He's the CEO of a billion-dollar company. He hmm. runs USANA. And I was just listening to him speak at a mastermind training. And he shared a very personal story, again, conversations, right? He shared a very personal story about um, his daughter struggling with mental health and sitting in the hospital with her, not knowing if she was going to make it and then going to an inpatient facility. And I remember, you know, going through that. And so all of a sudden it became relatable and I talked to him and now USANA's on board in a big way, supporting what we're doing um, as far as getting the message out. They're a global company with, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of, of distributors around the world and all of those people are, are going to be making the promise and sharing it. And it just goes to show like that vulnerability for just a minute created a relationship between Kevin and I, and then we were able to get USANA in. And that's what our thing is. We're trying to create this community of collaboration from all the companies, CEOs, celebrities, influencers, athletes to say, Hey, join this cause and set the example because you've either been directly or ind indirectly impacted by this. And if you can lead the way through your example by saying, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm Jason. I'm doing this. I'm a police officer. I'm doing this. Uh, it impacts those who respect you and follow you and just giving a little bit of appreciation and giving a little bit of love and, and putting it out there. And it doesn't take any time or, or money. So I just wanted to make sure I thanked them because this is what we're wanting to do is get everybody involved. Whoever can with the platform, you talk about the big coffee company, 
how easy is it to start talking about mental health? I mean, a lot of us go get a cup of coffee or a soda or whatever it is because we need that little kick. But it's also the social engagement. During COVID, when I couldn't go to the oh. convenience store and get my drink every day, I missed that face, you know, that interaction between just the clerk yeah. and the people I would see at the counter. And so, you know, I love that that we can kind of um, just find a way to start communicating, opening up, collaborating, knocking down walls, because when we're all trying to just accomplish the same thing, we can do so much more together. Oh, I couldn't agree uh, any more wholeheartedly. And uh, and you're right about the, the convenience store. There's this really nice lady that works at the one I go to. The, I tell you, Brandy, the head is hanging down low and slumped. And I walk in, hey, what's going on, Rosa? The head comes up. She's smiling, laughing, joking. And and I leave feeling good. And we need those kind of things, you know? We, 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 Our positivity. We yeah. Everybody wants to be seen. I mean, remember Cheers? It's like everybody wants to go where somebody knows their name. That's right. You you just, you want to be seen and recognized. And we, we're more disconnected. We're, we're connected, but more disconnected than we've ever been in our entire lives. And I just, it makes me sad because we need that. We're humans. We need that interaction. You need the hug. You need the eye contact. You need the skin to touch people. And yeah. Oh, God. And yeah, COVID. I mean, A, we're never going to get an apology for that shit, but I'm not going to get off into it in this uh, here podcast. Segment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You get me fired up real quick. And mainly just because I see that as a, as a parent of teenagers, the effect, the effect that it's had and 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 that striving to kind of get back. And, um, you know, for those that are listening, not watching, you know, you picked up your phone and, and you mentioned, yeah, we connect. But I mean, how disingenuous and authentic, inauthentic are people so often with it, <laughs> with social yeah. media? Like, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I might strive a little more than some others to be vulnerable about things, but people are still going to form a perception that they don't know the the reality of, you know? And I have a big love hate with social media and media, right? It's my career. It's how I make a living. It's how I connect with people all over the world. I love that. I love that we can spread hope and light with a click. I love that we can reach people. But I also hate how disconnected it makes us and this feeling of falsehood and, and mm -hmm. fake ID, ideas of what people are doing. There was a little girl overseas. I don't remember where she was, maybe Switzerland. She's 16 years old on Instagram and says, you know, I'm feeling depressed tonight. Should I kill myself? Yes or no? 69% of her so-called friends on social media said yes. And she did. And she did. And so there's the hate part. And, and that's why the suicide rate, I think, for kids has gone up 71% since 2010. Because, again, we have access at our fingertips. We have social media. We have smartphones. We're disconnected. We're not connecting. We have an idea of what we think is real and how we don't measure up. And it's not true. Those are lies. And so while I love it, you know, there's things about it I hate and I, and I hope we can break through it. But one of our things is, okay, well, everybody's on them. I'm on it. Everybody's on it. Yeah. So how do we use this as a force of good? How do we go to people where they are and the devices and platforms are on through the people they already know, like trust and follow and give the messages to them there, how they want to receive it. And hopefully people are receptive and, and I hope that they'll join our show September 10th because that's what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Which we're going to have that link is in the description there and we're going to do our best to collaborate with you on that, get it up and, and help with the live stream. But boy, I'm, I've never heard the story about that girl. And I hope those 69 people were in some way, shape or form held accountable because I, you know, understand that when, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to get pissed. This is me pissed. I don't fucking get how some asshole on the internet, especially when it's someone you don't know, you are willing to sit and mistreat. I see it with, with celebrities I know all the time. And I've had one in particular that has been awesome with helping me with some of that. Like, just ignore them. They want attention. But I don't get what is inside a person to be like, I'm going to just say something horrible, awful, negative. Oh, Let alone with this young lady, like 16. Like, yeah, no, it's like, no. Uh, get, I, well, you know what? Hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And and it's like there's so much bullying and cyberbullying. When I used to be on TV, I started reporting for Fox News when I was 20. I was on TV for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I would have people say the meanest things. 
wow, you're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're you, just whatever you can think of. People would say that to me. And I'm like, man, that hurts. And I remember one time somebody said something, they wrote in a, an email to the station I was working at and said something maybe about my hair, or I don't even know what it was, but it just hit me and it hurt. And I was bummed out. And I said, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. I don't like being judged publicly. And he said, Brandy, stop. Let me tell you something. For every one troll that sends a comment, there's 10,000 people out there that love you, that think you're great, that appreciate you. And that's what I have to tell myself now because the trolls will never stop. Bullies will always bully and they're going to be there. But for every one jerk out there that makes you feel worthless, there's 10,000 people out there who know you, love you, support you, or would. So don't give in to the one. They're just not worth your time. Let it go. Don't take it personal. I have one quick story I'd like to share on that thought. Okay, go for it. I was working on a production. This guy that I knew kind of, we hadn't worked a lot. He comes up, he's being a total tool, just a jerk. <laughs> Everything I say, he he was like salty. And I was getting so worked up. I'm like, hey, new guy, you don't get to come in and be rude to everybody. And And so I walk off and I just start getting worked up. I'm like, I am going to give that guy a piece of my mind. You don't get to come in and treat everybody like crap. So as I'm getting worked up, tell him what I think. I'm like, okay, I'm walking over. And as I'm walking over, I'm like, I'm going to give this guy a piece of my mind. And just then I was overcome with this impression, give him grace. And as I went over to give him a piece of mind, I decided to give him a piece of my heart. And I just said, hey, are you okay? And right when I said that, his face changed from kind of this upset to this sad. And pretty soon the tears started falling. And he said, you know, today's the anniversary of my wife's death. Oh. My children were struggling so hard this morning. And I was trying to make them breakfast and they were in tears. And then I had to drop them off and get here. And it's just really hard today. And I said, I am so sorry that you are going through this. And I gave him a hug. And we sat there and we cried and hugged for about a minute or two. The way people treat you isn't a reflection of you. It's a reflection of what they're going through. The way people treat you is not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of what they are going through. So don't take it personal. If somebody treats you bad, they're having bad things. They're feeling bad. Next time you want to give somebody a piece of your mind, Try giving them a piece of your heart. Choose kindness. Choose grace, and see how that works for you. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, boy. I'm forgetting the author's name. The Four Agreements, right now. One of them is uh, don't take things personally, which yeah. is hard. Which is hard. It's I mean, that's why I I encourage you know when I speak at at some of the high schools I do, uh, I tell them you know uh, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. Because what you're seeing, it might be a completely false representation. For example, like the story you're telling, that young man, he might have now in today's world, picture on social media smiling while going through all that in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. We just don't know. Everybody's going through hard things, man. Just choose kindness. When I volunteered at the hospital, I would sit there and, and be with families as they lost someone. I had a lady who's, she'd been married for 50 years. Her husband just died. We turned off life support. She had to go get dog food. And she said, I've never gone to the store to get dog food by myself. I have to go tonight. She was, she was paralyzed by this fear. She had to get in her car. She had to drive to the store. She had to go inside. I'm sure she drove distracted. I'm sure she cut in front of somebody or drove too slow. I'm sure when she got in the store, she might've stood in the middle of the aisle with her, you know, with her cart. And nobody knew that she just had to shut off life support of her partner of 50 years. And this is the first time she's had to be alone. And so we did a campaign called Choose Kindness. We don't know what anyone is going through. Maybe they just lost their child. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe they haven't eaten in three days. We don't know. So the way somebody treats you, it's not on you. It's what they're going through. So stop thinking that and just give them grace. It's a, that's a tough one. Well, and you've been it's a, hard. You've been a parent longer than I have, and boy, I I've been trying with that lesson lately. And it, you know, sometimes it feels <laughs> like it falls on deaf ears. But I mean, what are we gonna do, right? It might, uh, but you know, it's like the osmosis. 
they might not act like they hear us, but I think some it sinks through their skin. I, I I think so. I think it's the you know, it's almost like the thousand hours towards uh, uh, being an expert type of thing. It's I think mm-hmm. if you're you're inundated with something enough that it's there, it's like I had my youngest been a little bit distant but every night it was still i love you every morning i love you a hug and had asked me the other day like why do you why do you always do that i go because i love you and i never know when that last time i get to say that is and then the next morning opened up said don't take it personal explain what what they're going through and i was like okay you know and sometimes it takes a little bit of time as well you know just reaffirming hey i'm here for you there's something and you're ready to talk. Uh, I'm here. Okay. You know, ears open. Choose love. And and I love that you do that because honestly, you never know. You never know. So live your best life. Live each moment as if it's potentially your last. Last When you wake up, when you leave, your interactions. I, I try to do that. It's easier said than done, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. but, it, but I've just seen it too much. It's like, oh, this person got up, was having a great day. And then all of a sudden they dropped dead with an aneurysm. Yeah. You just honestly don't know. So I don't want to have regrets. That's one thing that um, dealing with my daughter, dealing with nobody dies alone and spiritual care. I just learned that I don't want to live with regrets. I live each day with purpose and intent. Mm-hmm. I choose things that matter. And I focus on what my priority is. I, I kind of triage each day as like, what are the most important things I can do? That's a great way to approach. It. I was going to ask you, um, A, I love your background, by the way, because you have a wonderful gradient going on. So for the people who can't see, it goes there. there <laughs> it's a bookshelf goes from red <laughs> to like orange, yellow, green, blue into purple, my favorite color. And, and oh, look at the multicolored nails. These are happy colors. You know, I'm not happy a, colors. I, I'm I'm not promoting any agendas. I just love bright, happy colors. And I feel like this is the least I can do to kind of bring your spirits up because you probably enjoyed this a little bit more than a gray wall. Absolutely. You got it. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is off of what you were just saying, how do you in this area, because I know sometimes it's really impactful for, for me that, you know, we find out the nonprofit I work at that uh, this family ended up losing their child or something that we were trying to help, for example, you know, it hurts. How do you maintain your mental health for you? What are some of your practices that, you know, are tried and true that, that you just have to go to? Like, like you said, we all strive our best to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I learned to, have a good relationship with God. That's Mm. super important to me. I spent a lot of time praying. I spent a lot of time in silence doing some meditation. I lean into my family and my friends and my faith. It's I've, I've got a great husband now. Um, I've got my kids that are, I love so much. I go and I take a walk. That's really good for me. And I go sit in the grass and I take my shoes off and I do some grounding or earthing or whatever you want to call it. But I just kind of take some moments to just be, to see, to feel, to just embrace those moments. But I have a lot of quiet time. And when I have quiet time, I spend it in prayer, but, and then I'm able to hear and get inspired. And that's important for me because I don't feel like sometimes I know what to do, but I do feel guided. Mm -hmm. And that's been a a big inspiration for me. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling, uh, um, he wasn't my sponsee, but a newcomer, a young guy, he was just asking me about like, Oh, my brain's always racing. And I'm like, well, you know, you could try to take a nap, but if you're like me, you can be wound up a little too much. I'm like, Hey, (laughs) jump in the shower. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, jump in the shower and observe how much your thoughts change. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And, and and they did. I said they just are because your your bot your brain's going to start activating some different stuff, and your head is going to become yep. much more clear. You know, now don't shower think- like twenty times a day, but you know, just try little new little things, and then eventually, you know, maybe it's working up to prayer, meditation, and things. But we got to do some stuff to just. Throw a little jolt, trigger the brain a little bit different. You know, it's like if you're a dog owner and you give the little dog the tap on the ribs and go, you know, to direct them differently. Same kind of thing with us. 
Yeah. And I, I guess now that you mentioned that I do find a lot of peace in a long, hot shower. Yeah. Every now and then I just sit and soak in the bathtub for like two hours. I mean, I'm <laughs> a wrinkled prune when I get out, but it's just that clarity, that peace, that cleansing of my mind doesn't stop. I, I run multiple companies. I go nonstop. If I sit down, I feel like I'm being unproductive and that's hard for me because I'm a very forward thinking. I like return on, on input and stuff. So it's a little tricky for me to slow down and rest, but I, but I, every now and then I just go, I need a reset and <laughs> I'm shutting down. You can find me in about four hours. <laughs> uh, and that's good that you do it and communicate it and make it yeah. clear. Yeah. You know, this is what I need right now. Yep. And we have dogs. We, I love dogs. We have Leon burgers. The big ones just had puppies yesterday. Love to go cuddle the dogs. Love to ride the four wheeler. Love to shoot my bow. I teach uh, self-defense and I teach firearms as well, like on a side thing. And so, you know, I, I find release in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, you shoot a recurve or a, a compound recurve. Oh, me too. Yeah, I love that. I love that it's, you know, it's on me. It's on my steadiness. It's on my release. It's on my eye. And I just, I love the recurve. Same. It, 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 and it leaves me more of a, it has so much more of a primal kind of feeling to it than, mm -hmm. than a compound. Like you were saying, yeah, it's just, it's all on me. Yeah, it really <laughs> does. Which is funny because the, the shoot, the shooting range I go to, because I'm six, three. Six two, six three, depending Just on what convenience guy. store I'm walking out of. So my bow will hit the the top because they didn't make the archery range high enough. So I'll kind of, you know, have to bend down and kind of tilt a little to the side. And when I'm pulling out of the quiver, so it kind of does have a bit of a different, you know, stance than yeah, you know, standard one. So yeah, it kind of. I mean, I'm a 45 year old child, so my mind runs off into fantasy immediately. Like you know, the deer's getting away, and I got to get it for my family. You know, whatever. We are twins. Are you a 77 or two? 78. Okay. I was the end of 77. So Okay. Uh, August of, of 78. Just had my 45th. All right. Yeah, I'm a little older. <laughs> Not wiser. I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I was going to give that. To, I was going to say probably a lot <laughs> wiser, too. And uh, relative. You got to remember, I stunted my brain for a good decade and a half with a lot of alcohol. So, you know, I'm still growing up. You know what? Let me just thank you for what you're doing. You've oh. taken something that was a painful experience. This is what I told my child. I said, you know what? We can't just let um, pain be pain. Like you've got to find purpose and passion and, and stuff in it or else it's just pain and pain is stupid. If we don't learn from our experiences and do something with them that helps, then what was the point of it? That's how I feel. So the fact that you went through that and you've got the lived experience and here you are doing this, putting your effort in, I'm sure you're not making billions of bucks for doing this, but you're doing it because you don't want anyone else to go through that and your heart's in the right place. So thank you for taking your pain and turning it into a purposeful mission. Oh, thank you so much. And likewise, I appreciate that. You know, I, um, I've been trying to put out a lot more positive content the, um, through my personal stuff and the Knocking Doors Down page. And one of the things I did was talked about pain when it came to the difference between the hero and the villain. And I, my favorite superhero, Batman, my favorite villain, the Joker. And if you look at it, they are the opposite side of each other. You know, we don't know the yeah. pain of the Joker per se, but if you end up that way, you've gone through a lot of pain. And so... Um, so, hey, th thank you so much. And thank and yeah. likewise, you know, I mean, the world needs needs more of it. And again, you don't have to do it in the capacity that that, that Brandy's doing it or I'm doing it. It's just it's simple. It can be simple stuff. Da Vinci said it best. Da Vinci said this. And this was my quote for last year. He said, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Mm. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do do something. I've been gathering the doers. You don't have to do grand, great things, but you can do something, whether it's going online and making the promise to live and sharing it, whether it's thanking somebody for serving you, smiling, holding the door, hugging your children, you can do something. We all can do something and doing something is better than doing nothing. Absolutely. All right. We're going to shift some gears. You ready? 
Yeah. All right. We're jumping to some random questions now to lighten the mood. And hey. uh, thank you again for saying what you did. That really means a lot. And that's one thing I try to tell people is if if someone did do something kind or that you appreciated, let them know because it's the only way they're going to know. Yeah. Not mind readers. No, <laughs> I've not. I've not figured out that perfection uh, uh, profession. All right. Um, last book you read on purpose and what did you get out of it? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm horrible with actual titles. OK, but I read Daryl Eves. It's it's like YouTube secrets mm. or something. The secrets to YouTube. I love reading and I love books. And what I, I was trying to get out of that is I'm trying to figure out how we can take these messages and reach more people who need to hear it. Yeah. Oh, I same. If you figured it out, please let me know. <laughs> We're going to keep in touch here. Cause trying to crack the code. Daryl leaves. We need your help. Mr. Beast. We need your help, please. Right. Yeah. No. And he's, I mean, he's found a really unique way to, Get that okay. Anyways, we're not going to talk more about him. He gets enough attention on the internet. He does. Uh, you can have dinner with any one person, living or not. Who are they and why? Well, I mean, I don't know if if Jesus, like, of course, right? If it, it, I would love that, that's cool. Answer a lot of questions for me, and and just he's the best person. I also think, and this might be slightly controversial, but I would love to pick Elon Musk's brain. Oh, yeah. And also tell him he needs to get my cyber truck here like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you on the waiting list? I've only been on the waiting list for almost four years now, but who's counting? Uh, right. Um, but no, I'm with you on that. I mean, hey, people don't like it, whatever. I mean, and that's the good thing that I think people should learn from someone like an Elon Musk is when you reach a certain level of success in a way that you do life, you're going to have people that don't like you. There's so many armchair quarterbacks who love to throw out, you know, insults and stuff. It's like, OK, you might not love everything somebody else does, but they're doing they're trying. Mm -hmm. They're putting an effort. What are you doing? Don't mm -hmm. criticize. Go do something. If you don't like it, if you don't like the way things are going, don't complain. Mm -hmm. Get off your butt and go do something about it or yeah. shut up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Um, oh, I had a new one that I did recently. Now I'm drawing a blank. Uh, all right, we'll do this one. You're stranded on a deserted island. You have one movie and one music artist. Greatest hits. What are they? Oh, dang. You ask... You ask hard questions. Uh, okay. On the island, I have one movie. Uh -huh. This is so random. Uh, I like Bernie with Jack Black. Okay. It's a 2010 movie. It's, 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 it's hilarious. I think I it's it. hilarious too. I, I just, I don't know what it is about that. I just laugh. I, I love the line. They have more, they have more tattoos than teeth. And I think it's just funny that it's a true story about, you know, kind of the same thing. He, was, was he an angel or a villain? Yeah. You've got this guy who did something horrible, but he was also one of the most loved guys in the community. And it's a true story, but there's humor and just great acting. So I, I, that's one of the movies I watch several times a year. I don't know why. I just like it. All right. Okay. And one soundtrack. Oh, my artist goodness. greatest artist greatest hits. Artist greatest hits. Um, probably give me some Coldplay. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's got kind of a good mix. There's going to be your emotional tunes when you just want to lay in the sand and cry because you're going to die. <laughs> and then there's like other things that inspire you to carry on and get going. And uh, I just feel like that's something that always feels good to my heart. Well, keep hope alive. I didn't say you were stranded on the island forever. We're getting off okay, the damn okay. island, Brandy. All right, we're getting <laughs> off that freaking island. Okay, my question, fair well, play, right? Sure. I say this, you're on death row. It's your last dying meal, your final meal in life. What is it? A, I hate that I've done anything to be on death row. I'm just going to say that now. <laughs> um, hopefully I'm on death row because I've exposed a lot of the BS that go goes on in our government daily. And uh, that's why they're putting me there. My last meal. Oh, my God. Your dying last meal. What are you going to eat? What's your favorite thing? It's either going to be chicken parmesan or 
No, I'm going to go country fried steak or chicken fried steak, depending on where you live. Some good mashed potatoes and gravy uh, with some Portuguese green beans. Okay. I don't know what Portuguese green beans are, but I make fried green beans. They're delicious. And I make a killer mashed potatoes and gravy. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. No, Portuguese. It's like uh, got a little bit of tomato in it, some bacon and other stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's okay. pretty good. Uh, what about you? What would be your last meal? I always struggle because there's two things that are just my top two all time favorites. A good sirloin. Oh, potatoes yeah. and gravy. Right. Like I love me a steak. But I also love a smothered burrito with cheese, Ooh. like an, an enchilada sauce. I love a good burrito. So I'm kind of debating between the two. But I, I guess, honestly, at the end of the day, it'd probably be the steak. Yeah. Now, steak. Yeah, that would like a bacon wrap filet mignon just done Ooh. right. Or now I'm now I'm getting hungry here. <laughs> yeah. What's for dinner? Right. Oh, <laughs> how about this? What's the dessert with that meal? Oh, easy. Turtle cheesecake. I've never had turtle cheesecake. What's turtle little cheesecake? Little caramel, pecans, maybe a little hint of chocolate. Ah. Yeah, try it at Cheesecake Factory and yeah. I will next time I'm there if they have it. I, I, I would probably go like a chocolate ice cream of some kind or something. I... Out of all my vices now, the one I can't walk away from, Brandy, if people's like, well, we got ice cream. Ah, shit. Okay. <laughs> you had me at I. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going with that. Yeah. Uh, Brandy, if you could uh, let everyone again know the easiest way to connect with you, I'm going to put those links in the podcast description when the um, the live streaming event is coming up. And then yes. I want to ask you to leave us with some final thoughts. Okay. Um, you can find me on social media, Brandy Vega. You can email me Brandy L Vega at Gmail. It's Brandy with a Y. Um, the website is promise, the number two live.org. And then we also have gooddeedrevolution.org. Reach out on any of those sites, hit me up. I do want to hear from you. I do care about you. Our event is September 10th. It's called Promise to Live. We've got singers, dancers, celebrities, influencers, a night of music and entertainment, hope and help and healing and resources. It's going to be great. And I hope that you will be there. I hope you'll share it. Um, it's an annual event. And then we'll probably be doing some concert series and things like that. The campaign Promise to Live, go there, make the promise, share the promise. That's ongoing. It's never going away. My dream and goal would be to have Promise to Live be like, make a wish or Habitat for Humanity, or, you know, Five for the Fight, or whatever it is. Like, this needs to be a global name and campaign that happens all the time. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so very much, Brandy. I leave you with the uh, final thoughts. Anything else you would like to share? I think you asked about a book that I've read. This is one I actually got to write. I, I just got to do a chapter in it. And it's called Bringing Value, Solving Problems, and Leaving a Legacy. That's my greatest goal in life. I, I want to make sure wherever I'm at that I bring value to the people or the places or whatever it is I'm doing. I want to help solve problems, whether it's mental health or math. Of course, you're out of luck if it's math. <laughs> in the day, I want to, you know, I want to leave a legacy. I want the world uh. to be better because I was here. And one of the quotes that I have in here is something that struck me. I had a pretty hard childhood. I feel like life is what's given, opportunity is what's taken. None of us get to decide what we're born into, who we're born to, wh whether we have a silver spoon or not, but every single day you have a chance to make the best of it because you have opportunity. So life is what's given, opportunity is taken, and you have an opportunity to take whatever and be whatever and choose whatever you want every single day. Don't give that up. Take advantage of it. Randy Vega, thank you so much. On that note, keep knocking doors down, everybody. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast, featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.